It brings you back to a sense of normalcy. It's like you have a hand again. Advanced prosthetic hands on the market can do lots of things. These are beautiful prosthetics with incredible capabilities, but we've had no way to control them. To get that kind of control, you really have to go to the nerves. The problem with most of the technologies we have is that the signals are really tiny. You have tiny little peripheral nerve signals and you have noise in those signals that's about the same size. So when you try to hear what a peripheral nerve is saying, you actually can't hear it. We designed a way to connect up with the peripheral nerves with a piece of muscle. And then what happens is when a tiny little peripheral nerve signal comes down the nerve, it goes into the muscle and it becomes a huge muscle signal. We've now seen, to my knowledge, the largest voltage recorded from a nerve compared to all previous results. That makes these signals big enough um, that we can record them and interpret them for controlling a prosthetic hand. Brought back into my mind the thought of, well, if I had something like this, I could actually be out working without risking hurting myself. I think it's a really good step into the future. It's a good way to move forward for not only me, but for other people. You can make a prosthetic hand do a lot of things, but that doesn't mean that the person is intuitively controlling it. So the, the difference is the person just thinks about moving. This worked on the very first time we tried it. So now we can access signals associated with individual thumb movement, multi-degree of freedom thumb movement, uh, individuated fingers, and this opens up a whole new world for people who are upper limb prosthesis users. <laughs>
carved out of wood or a hand carved out of wood that sort of looked like a hand that they wore on their limb, but it didn't really do much for them. Right. And then we started developing these mechanical devices, even during civil war times, they had these mechanical devices that were the hook kind of like what you see now. Yeah. They were developed in the civil war. Really? Civil war time. And when those things work by you extend your arm out, when you do the hook would open. And then when you brought your arm back, a rubber band would close it. And that's actually the limb that a lot of people still use today, which is remarkable that, you know, as of 2022, the limb that most people use is controlled by rubber bands and cables. (laughs) From the Civil War? Really? Um, Yeah. But it has been functional. Yeah. Yeah, it's functional for sure. But, you know, even though some of the materials have gotten a little bit better, the general concepts really haven't gotten that much better. So, so what have people tried to do? So people have like designed these limbs that are motorized and people, a lot of people, even people listening today have probably seen some of those, but, and they just pick up muscle signals through the skin, but not many muscle signals. And they can just sort of maybe open and close. Right. And that's it, but they're not really a hand. Right. And so people aren't really getting that hand back. So So what people have tried to do is they've tried to get the signals that control the hand. So you can get signals that control the hand. You can either get it directly from the brain where the signals start. So I think to move my hand, the signals start in my brain. They go down my neck, down my spinal cord, down my nerves to where my hand used to go. And that's that's your focus of research, right? That's been your life. Yeah. Yep. And that's the thing. And so you can either pick it up directly from the brain or you can pick it up from the peripheral nerves, from the nerves in the limb that's still there. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting, Rod, that when people lose a hand, the signals are still going to the hand, even though they don't have a hand. Their brain doesn't know they don't have a hand. Really? So the signals are still going. So if you can connect up to the peripheral nerves, all those signals that used to go to control your hand are still there. So if you can record those electrical signals, like recording the signals in a wire, right. you could then interpret those signals, feed those to the prosthesis and have a prosthesis move like a hand. Wow. So I didn't know yeah, that. So it's, yeah. So that's amazing. So then engineers for decades have made these really fancy ways to try to connect up with the peripheral nerves. They've wrapped little electrodes around the nerves and tried to pick up the signals from them. They've stuck wires into the nerves to try to pick signals. The problem is, is the nerve signals are really small. And the electrical noise in your body is almost the same size. So it's hard to interpret what the nerve is saying because the signals are so small. So so you've been, I think, since 2006 working on this exact issue and problem. So, So tell us where you've come from and then where we are today and why this is so amazing and revolutionary. Yeah. Yeah. So, so thanks. So what we decided you had to do is not to design a better electro to try to pick out these tiny little signals from all this noise, but if we could connect up with the nerves and amplify the signals, we just put an amplifier there, then it'd be easy to understand what the nerves in the brain are saying and to make it easy. And these, so these peripheral nerves that are left over. Yeah. Oh, neat. Yeah. So we take a small piece of muscle and we connect it to the end of the nerve. The nerve re that muscle, which is what the nerve used to do when a hand was there. Right. And when it re that muscle, now we don't actually have to record nerve signals. Now we can record these huge amplified muscle signals. So wow. now we have muscle wow. signals like this and noise like this. Now, all of a sudden, it's easy. That's amazing. So, and, now, and, then, and, and you've done that? You've done that multiple mm-hmm. times, right? Yep. So then, uh, so all the original experiments were to demonstrate that it actually would work. It, in concept, it would work, but we never showed it. And then we finally moved into humans. And now we actually have the ability to take a nerve, a single big nerve in a body and break it into its little parts because a peripheral nerve is like a, like a multi braided wire, lots of different signals carried in it. Wow. And if you can spread out each of those individual wires or nerve fascicles are called and put a little muscle on each of them. Now you can actually amplify all sorts of different signals and you can get all the control signals you need to control a hand 
like the hand that was there originally. Awesome. So it's, it's absolutely incredible. So to date now, we've implanted three humans with electrodes on their, they're called regenerative peripheral nerve interfaces on these little pieces of muscle on the end of the nerve. And we have people controlling individual fingers of their hand on a prosthetic. So you've done three, three, three humans and, um, and how is it, how are they, how are they doing? And when was, when, when it was the longest, uh, you said it was implanted. Is it one operation, two operations? What is it? Yeah. So, so the people that we have now, what we found out interestingly along the way is we also found out that when we put these little pieces of muscle on the end of the nerve, we could prevent people with amputations from having neuroma pain and phantom pain. So anyone that knows somebody who lost a limb, you'll hear them talk about phantom pain. Right. Their foot, their ankle might hurt horribly badly, even though they don't have a foot. Right. But their brain doesn't know they don't have a foot. So the, they're still getting that sensation. So when we put those little pieces of muscle on the end of the nerve, the nerve re it. It settles the whole thing down. Wow. So it takes away that neuroma pain and that phantom pain. And so we have now, I've done about 250 patients I've operated on just to control neuroma pain and phantom pain. But once we had those people, we were able to go back in a second operation, implant electrodes into those regenerative peripheral nerve interfaces and then have those people control their prosthetics. So the first person we implanted electrodes in was in 2018. Wow. And um, we have one person that's now three and a half years with the electrodes in, and it's working as well as it did on day one. Really? I mean, and this is an upper extremity one? Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to, and we're going to, yeah. and we'll show that. We're going to show that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah that's amazing. Yeah. So they're back doing a lot of their activities of daily living and, Yep. So, so what happens is, is we still, all of this is still a clinical trial through the FDA. Right. So the people are not walking around town yet with these advanced prosthetic devices that move their individual fingers. So we still have a couple more steps to go through the FDA until we're going to be to the point where we're going to let people just walk around town and use them all day long. Okay. But that's not but that's not that far away. Really? So and, and what do you, so like if I know people are going to be very excited. So what do you conjecture next couple of years or soon? Uh, yeah, probably, probably within two years, we're going to be in a position where people are going to be taking these devices home and using them every single day. And uh, I'm so excited about it. We've also done, interestingly, some of the prosthetics have sensors on the fingertips of the prosthetics. Wow. So like if you grab something, it can feel pressure between the prosthetic fingers, but we can take that electrical signal and we can feed that back through the regenerative peripheral nerve interface. It sends a signal back to the brain that your fingers are touching something so they can get sensation back. So is it like also warmth and cold? Can they eventually feel that? Or Eventually, eventually would. We'll, Hopefully, we'll have the ability to give all the different types of senses. But for right now, it's touch. Touch, which is it's huge. and pressure. Yeah, which is yeah. huge because that'll contribute to our ability to act of dailies of active living and, you know, their yeah. daily, you know, things they have to do in personal care. I mean, that's that's amazing. Yeah. So and what's the, you know, I know it's obviously you're speaking about the present and some of the future. So how long do these devices last since they're man-made, not God-made? And, and then how much will they cost? I mean, I'm, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about that. So I thought you should just answer it. Potentially. Yeah. I know you don't know for sure. So, yeah. So, so prosthetics, it's interesting because you can make a prosthetic that's really powerful. You could make a prosthetic like Steve Austin and the $6 million man had that would crush metal. <laughs> but that thing is the motors are so powerful right. that it'd be too heavy and you couldn't carry it around. <laughs> okay. You could, you could 3d print a hand right. that's incredibly light, but that's not going to be durable at all. You go to lift something up heavy and it's just going to break. break. Right. So, so you have to balance all of these different things. How heavy is the device? How durable is it? What job are they going to do? But I think what's going to happen in the future is there's going to be a whole suite okay. of hands available, depending upon what you're going to do. If you're a laborer, if you're an accountant, if you're a surgeon, surgeon. whatever. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Whatever it is. And then you'll be able to use one of those. As far as the price goes, 
they're pretty expensive now to make because there are not many of them made. So I sort of in, you know, an, an advanced prosthetic can might be a hundred thousand okay. dollars. However, I remember when the first calculators came out and they were $250 and all they did is simple arithmetic. <laughs> and it wasn't that long. It wasn't that long after that, that you bought a bag of groceries and you got a calculator for free. <laughs> exactly. So, I, I'm assuming, so I'm assuming with this, now that we have a way to control them, people will start making more and more of them and the price is going to come down on these. Yeah, that's right. And you know, yeah. you, when you get people like maybe Elon Musk or somebody who's just a brilliant person working with you, who's a brilliant person and you can make them more cost effective and more efficient. I mean, so that's, that's amazing. Well, that's like, you know, that's like the future now. And, and, you know, when I look back, you know, my career, we would try and put limbs on and hands. And of course, especially if it was outside the hand, the distal radius, it, didn't work that well. And then, and also so did hand transplants. And you talk about costs, each one of those was well over a half a million. But the other thing is it was the immunosuppression, which is really what a lot of people don't like. It's lifelong. I mean, it's something different for hearts and livers and lungs, but for a hand, it's a problem. Yeah. And, and I agree with you a hundred percent. I, you know, they have to be able to solve the issue of immunosuppression on these hands because right. I do want them to keep working on it because if they solve the issues and, and we don't have any risks associated with immunosuppression, I would just transplant the thumb and just give them a thumb back right. if, I, if I could. But, um, but at least right now, the two things that are standing in the way is the immunosuppression that right. can be really dangerous. Um, and then the time it takes for nerves to regenerate. So if you have an amputation above the level of the elbow, it takes a long time for the nerves to get back to where they need to go. And by that time, the muscles aren't very good anymore. Right. And that's a big problem so, that we've seen clinically in, in the hand transplant uh, yeah. era. Yeah, no, yeah. it's good. Oh, and, and the same thing, even if you have a, an injury where you lose an arm at that level and they successfully put it back on, that hand isn't going to work very well because it just takes too long for those nerves to regenerate. They only grow back at an inch a month. Wow. So you can imagine an injury that happens just at, you know, just beyond the shoulder. It's two years before the nerves are getting back to where they need to go. And by that time, the muscles aren't healthy anymore. Right. So, of course, Paul, you've worked on this since 2006. You've had a lot of obviously, you know, funding and grant. And of course, you're at the great University of Michigan. All of those are phenomenal places. And so it's you're going forward. So tell us also, like. So if you had to project in the future, I know you're going to say you can pick your arm based upon your occupation and it won't, it'll be, it won't cost, you know, an arm and a leg, so to speak, but it will, in other words, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be cost effective. So what do you think eventually, if you had your crystal ball, you could say, okay, uh, you have an injury, you can then pick your prosthetic. It'll have more than touch potentially. I mean, just kind of what is your vision for five, 10 years from now? I mean, you know, so you're going to kind of project because, you know, you're going to, you're a very goal oriented guy. So what, what would you project, Paul? So I think the, the biggest thing that's going to happen is, is I think there's going to be personalized prosthetics because I like for that. me, for me, if I lose, I'm going to use them all day long, Okay, but that's not, but that's not that far away. Really? So and, and what do you, so like if I know people are going to be very excited. So what do you conjecture next couple of years or soon? Uh, yeah, probably, probably within two years, we're going to be in a position where people are going to be taking these devices home and using them every single day. And uh, I'm so excited about it. We've also done, interestingly, some of the prosthetics have sensors on the fingertips of the prosthetics. Wow. So like if you grab something, it can feel pressure between the prosthetic fingers, but we can take that electrical signal and we can feed that back through the regenerative peripheral nerve interface. It sends a signal back to the brain that your fingers are touching something so they can get sensation back. So is it like also warmth and cold? Can they eventually feel that? Or Eventually, eventually would. We'll, Hopefully, we'll have the ability to give all the different types of senses. But for right now, it's touch. Touch, which is it's huge. and pressure. Yeah, which is yeah. huge because that'll contribute to our ability to act of dailies of active living and, you know, their yeah. daily, you know, things they have to do in personal care. I mean, that's that's amazing. Yeah. So, and what's the, you know, 
I know it's obviously you're speaking about the present and some of the future. So how long do these devices last since they're man-made, not God-made? And, and then how much will they cost? I mean, I'm, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about that. So I thought you should just answer it. Potentially. Yeah. I know you don't know for sure. So, yeah. So, so prosthetics, it's interesting because you can make a prosthetic that's really powerful. You could make a prosthetic like Steve Austin and the $6 million man had that would crush metal. <laughs> but that thing is the motors are so powerful right. that it'd be too heavy and you couldn't carry it around. <laughs> okay. You could, you could 3d print a hand right. that's incredibly light, but that's not going to be durable at all. You go to lift something up heavy and it's just going to break. Break. Right. So, so you have to balance all of these different things. How heavy is the device? How durable is it? What job are they going to do? But I think what's going to happen in the future is there's going to be a whole suite okay. of hands available, depending upon what you're going to do. If you're a laborer, if you're an accountant, if you're a surgeon, surgeon. whatever. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Whatever it is. And then you'll be able to use one of those. As far as the price goes, they're pretty expensive now to make because there are not many of them made. So I sort of in, you know, an, an advanced prosthetic hand might be a hundred thousand okay. dollars. However, I remember when the first calculators came out and they were $250 and all they did is simple arithmetic. <laughs> and it wasn't that long. It wasn't that long after that, that you bought a bag of groceries and you got a calculator for free. <laughs> exactly. So I, I'm assuming so I'm assuming with this, now that we have a way to control them, people will start making more and more of them. And the price is going to come down on these. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, yeah. you, when you get people like maybe Elon Musk or somebody who's just a brilliant person working with you, who's a brilliant person, and you can make them more cost effective and more efficient. I mean, so that's that's amazing. Well, that's like, you know, that's like the future now. And, and you know, when I look back you know, my career, we would try and put limbs on and hands. And of course, especially if it was outside the hand, the distal radius, it didn't work that well. And then, and also so did hand transplants. And you talk about costs, each one of those was well over a half a million. But the other thing is it was the immunosuppression, which is really what a lot of people don't like. It's lifelong. I mean, it's something different for hearts and livers and lungs, but for a hand, it's a problem. Yeah. And, and I agree with you a hundred percent. I, you know, they have to be able to solve the issue of immunosuppression on these hands because right. I do want them to keep working on it because if they solve the issues and, and we don't have any risks associated with immunosuppression, I would just transplant the thumb and just give them a thumb back right. if I, if I could. But, um, but at least right now, the two things that are standing in the way is the immunosuppression that's Right. can be really dangerous. Um, and then the time it takes for nerves to regenerate. So if you have an amputation above the level of the elbow, it takes a long time for the nerves to get back to where they need to go. And by that time, the muscles aren't very good anymore. Right. And that's a big problem so, that we've seen clinically in, in the hand transplant uh, yeah. era. Yeah. No, yeah. it's good. Oh, and, and the same thing, even if you have a, an injury where you lose an arm at that level and they successfully put it back on that hand, isn't going to work very well because it just takes too long for those nerves to regenerate. They only grow back at an inch a month. Wow. So you can imagine an injury that happens just at, you know, just beyond the shoulder. It's two years before the nerves are getting back to where they need to go. And by that time, the muscles aren't healthy anymore. Right. So of course, Paul, you've worked on this since 2006. You've had a lot of obviously, you know, funding and grant. And of course you're at the great university of Michigan. All of those are phenomenal places. And so it's, you're going forward. So tell us also like, so if you had to project in the future, I know you're going to say you can pick your arm based upon your occupation and it won't, it'll be, it won't cost, you know, an arm and a leg, so to speak, but it will, in other words, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be cost effective. So what do you think eventually, if you had your crystal ball, you could say, okay, uh, you have an injury, you can then pick your prosthetic. It'll have more than touch potentially. I mean, just kind of, what is your vision for five, 10 years from now? I mean, you know, so you're going to kind of project because, you know, you're going to, you're a very goal oriented guy. So what, what would you project, Paul? So I think the, the biggest thing that's going to happen is, is I think there's going to be personalized prosthetics because I like for that. me, for me, if I lose an arm, I have a specific job. 
I have specific activities I'd like to do. And my body has a certain shape and size. I need the prosthetic arm to be the exact same size as my good arm. I can't have one long and one short. I can't have one heavy and one light. Okay. So personalized. Personalized. Okay. I like it. Personalized shape and size and weight. And then I would also imagine that I'm going to have different prosthetics that I'm going to be able to get for some of my activities too. So if I'm a surgeon, I have one that I'm going to use while I'm operating, which is really, really lightweight, but really fast, but is really delicate. But then if I'm out working in the yard, I have a heavier duty one that's more powerful that isn't going to break when I use it. And so I'm envisioning a whole, a whole suite of products that are going to (laughs) basically give us, give us our, arms back, our legs back, but then also give us our lives back. That's, that's amazing, Paul. Uh, That's unbelievable. That's really futuristic and it's coming. Uh, We're going to wrap it up here in a bit, but it's coming and the future is now. So, I mean, that's Paul, that's exciting. I mean, I'll tell you, you know, the future is now. And I think, um, you know, in this age of technology, it's so good for medicine to finally be part of it. Cause so many times medicine lags behind in technology and, and I think, you know, you, you hit it right on the head about, you know, transplantation surgery. If we can solve those two major issues, you know, we can do good things. But boy, the, the biomechanics of what you're talking about, they're the here and now. And, and they're, they're things that are coming to fruition now. And I like that. And I think that gives a lot of hope to people that have lost their limbs. And it gives them the hope uh, that it's a reality coming soon. And obviously with what you're doing, Paul is going to be, you know, transformational in, in getting them to get back to their normal life, like you said. So I cannot thank you enough for what you do, who you are. And, um, you know, it's exciting. It's always exciting. And then of course, uh, go blue. So Paul, any final comments? (laughs) So. Yeah, well, thanks so much. I, I will tell you, I think one of the things that's most exciting is getting back to your point of, I think when you combine people from medicine with people from technologic backgrounds, right. you have an opportunity to really have an impact. You have an opportunity to change the world. You have the opportunity to look at a problem that other people have been working on for a long time and haven't seen it from the same perspective that you have in medicine. So I may not be the best engineer ever, but I know a bunch of really good ones. <laughs> yeah, especially and, in and, Michigan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And no, the engineers I know are not very good surgeons, but they know, <laughs> they know a pretty good one. Yeah. But when we get, but when we get together, we really have an opportunity to really make an impact. And so I will tell you, it, it's so exciting to have an opportunity to do something that I'm really passionate about and to help these people that need so much help that just haven't gotten it over the years. Yeah. So it's really a pleasure. Uh, and thanks for, thanks for having me. It's a, it's nice to talk to you. It's nice to share this journey. With well, you. you know, you can see, uh, you know why I like Paul Sederna? Cause he just talks about life and with a passion, he loves plastic surgery. And I love people like that because you're passionate about what you do. You're passionate about who you are and what you do and you give back and you're a great teacher. So I love that. So go blue and uh, let's do it again. And I look forward to the next time when you, when we talk about what's, what's happening next and probably the new prosthetic arm and hand. So, all right. Well, thanks so much, Paul. Have a great one. Thank you. You bet. Yeah.